Welcome to Eccentric Mold and Engineering's webinar. Thank you for joining us for our Plastic Injection Molding Parts Troubleshooting Clinic. I'm Connie and I'll be your host for this session. A few things to cover before I turn over the webinar to our keynote speakers. This presentation is expected to last approximately 30 minutes. This will be an interactive discussion today as we feature a variety of part case studies, so please ask questions as we go. Feel free to submit your questions using the chat function located in the lower right hand corner of the control panel as we go. <clears throat> With that, I'll now turn over our webinar to our keynote speakers, John Sidorowitz, Darwin Rowe, and Glenn Miller. Gentlemen, please tell us a little bit about yourselves. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Sidorowitz. I'm VP of Inside Sales here at Eccentric. I've uh, been with the company for just about nine years now. Um, been in the plastic industry roughly 15 years. Glenn? Glenn Miller, joint engineer. I've uh, been with Eccentric for over a year and a half now. Uh, got about uh, 25 years of uh, injection mold design and build. I'm Darwin Rowe. I've been with Eccentric for over a year. Uh, I've got 25 years of design and building molds. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining this afternoon. Uh, like Connie said, this is going to be kind of going to be an interactive uh, webinar. And what we're going to do is uh, basically kind of show a part, uh, describe what type of part it is, it's, it's kind of functionality, some of the challenges that uh, we encountered with it, you know, point out, you know, key features or certain features, and um, then as the questions come in, try to answer them um, in regards to that part and kind of do this, you know, as long as we can um, throughout this next uh, 30 minutes. So with that, let's uh, get started. So, kind of start off with this part here. Um, change this. Excuse me. Just do an exploded view here. So this part is pretty unique uh, in the sense it's it's got a lot going on. Oh, why is that doing that? Um, we've got some internal threads here. Um, we've got some core outs all the way around, uh, as well as some. Oh, just wanted to move on me, as well as some undercuts that, that have to be caught here. Um, so this is uh, an agricultural type part um, for fluid. Um, and again, some of the key features, like I said, were the threads, the undercuts, uh, and the core outs. Uh, kind of a quick disconnect here on this end and the threaded connection on this end. Uh, let me see if I can just isolate this part really quick. There it is. So the other thing, you know, another key feature on this, not only the threads, but we have this little core out around that. Um, you know, we can get a better detail on this end. So we've got a seal surface on this side, um, and then the undercuts. So if we bring everything back. Um, so this customer wanted to automate this tool as much as they could. Um, so we do see we have a slide here on this end, uh, a couple hand loads, and then this unscrewing core, which you can also see there's a loose piece within a loose piece. So this green piece would come out first from the tool, uh, and then the orange part would unscrew. And the, the square feature on the back of that uh, is also uh, intentional as it would be used to, to help demold that uh, thread off of the part itself. That feature right there. Right. Yep. So you'd be able to latch on a, a wrench or, a or, wrench or something or a, or a custom made or... tool to unscrew that from the plastic part. Um, in a production setting, you would use something like an unscrewing core or you know, maybe even strippable threads. Any questions on this part? Um, you know, two side pieces for those core outs, those are hand loads as well. Um, in a different application, those could be uh, created with slides as well. Correct. Yeah, this one was a cross between, you know, cost and um, timing. <clears throat> All right, so we don't have any questions on this one. We'll go to the next one. And why is it? Oh, let's go ahead and up here. <coughs> Excuse 
excuse me. So this is a, um, a cover. Um, it's a fairly large cover. It's roughly about 18 inches by 12 or so. Um, and we'll show kind of what we're working with here. So this one's, it's, it's mainly, you know, hand loads or uh, actions due to these chamfered holes all the way around the part. Um, and with having that, it's going to require actions on the outside versus the inside. Uh, and then having those actions on the outside of the part, if this is a cosmetic part, will leave witness lines, um, which could be an issue. Uh, in this case, it really wasn't a cosmetic part. This was getting buried into something, so it wasn't going to be seen by the customer. Um, but typically, you'd want to, to create holes like this, you know, kind of pass throughs and, and, and capture those holes through the inside of the part and have those witness lines inside from, from those actions. Um, another thing, you know, this, this hole could not be cheated where you can capture it in the line of draw, so that required a hand load uh, as we, oops. Um, just, excuse me here. So we can kind of see through the part there. So you can see we've got multiple hand loads kind of pulling around the part. And then you can see where uh, the edges of those hand loads, as John said, would create some uh, some seam witness lines on there. That have to be determined that uh, the quoting phase, if that's acceptable, you need to go a different route. Correct. So where there's empty space, that would be captured by either the core cavity in this case, and I'm assuming the cavity. The main parting line would be you know, down here. So. Fairly simple part, but you know, just things to think about um, your actions and, and witness lines left behind, um, you know, by those slides or, or hand pulls as we do, uh, as we do here. Any questions on uh, on this part? And again, if we can always go back to parts if something uh, something comes up. So. This one's a, a pretty interesting part. Uh, this was for uh, automotive application. So this was a uh, tube to feed um, feed gas into uh, a motor. And this one's actually, the, it's an overmold. Um, they kind of do an exploded view here. So, so this is our first part here that we mold. And then we overmold this sort of thicker jacket around it. So what we have to do is actually um, mold in a 60 thousandths through hole throughout this entire part. Um, actually, this was the older version. So we overmolded actually a rubber or um, nylon tube throughout this part. And it's hard to control that tube and where it moves in here or during the injection process. It may float and move to this edge or this inside edge, depending on the material's filling. So the customer couldn't have any exposed tubing, so the, the solve was to um, overmold the jacket around that. So if there was any um, thin wall or any thin wall or, out. right. So that's what this jacket kind of came in. Um, and then we have a couple hand loads, as you can see here. Um, you know, to create this end here, and there's another one here. So there is actually a, a thin wire that would ride into the, the tube. And actually, I don't have that in here, but um, it was a, a Teflon specific coated length and a diameter. particular bend to it that had to be pretty much exact in order to fill that part correctly with the proper wall thickness on all sides. So yeah, this is a pretty intricate design just due to the overmolding of that tube or that through hole. I mean, overall, I mean, just looking on the outside of the part, it looks pretty easy, but um, you know, that we've done quite a few iterations and, and this part's now in production. Um, the gating on this one, you can see, you know, the runner system come in. So we, we actually put two gates in and the idea of that is to keep even pressures throughout the, the fill process to try to center that tube all the way down. Um, if you had one gate shooting in on either side, it's going to force the tube to, to one side or the other. Um, that's why we have the dual gates there. And 
And any questions? Yet. Um, next, we have this. Let me just isolate it. So we can see what we're dealing with here. So this is a medical uh, part, catheter hub, wide body, um, lower connectors. So we've got a lot going on in this little part. Um, a lot of tiny, unique shutoffs uh, at angles on you know round on round. And if we you know, kind of section this part, um, I don't know if we're going to be able to see much in here. No, not so much. Um, what we can do is kind of hide this part. And you can kind of see all the, the tight little unique shutoffs go, kind of going on in this part. Um, you got diameter shutting off on diameters. Um, it needs to be pretty much exact in order to have proper shutoffs within, within the ID of that part. And also, I mean, we've got some those small IDs and we have to hold those center. So that's what these kind of yellow core pins um, you see are standoffs are holding those center within the part. Um, holding these core pins. So as the mold opens, you know, those go away with the core and cavity, and then these these parts will be pulled out after molding. In, in a normal production setting, they'd be, you know, automated actions. And understand that the, the part design here uh, had to take into consideration those pins coming in to lock the internal in there uh, so there would be a hole in the part so that's something that has to be you know, filled or done something with later. Done post process. Correct. Um, again, dual gate to try to keep things centered throughout the main of the body, but um, you've got the three wings uh, kind of filling, but you know, this was a successful part. Um, it was prototype. Um, customers since then have gone into production. And those thread features are actually open and shut. Correct. Not requiring a handle to surround that. Now this area did, this barb did um, require the handle because the customer could not have a parting line on it. So, and this one as well. So as you can see, you know, this is kind of buried into, into the tool at that point. So the parting line moves to back here instead of, you know, open and close or in the line of draw with the core and cavity. Um, we do have a question. It looks like, why do the gates come in at an angle in the tube over mold example versus 90 degrees to the part? So kind of go back to this one. I'm trying to, trying to get the flow of the plastic down through the part rather than come in from the side perpendicular. And then you've also got hand load in the, in the area there as well and if uh, by 90 you mean coming in from the side of the diameter uh, just as as far as flow and fill goes it's just a better uh, location in the tube we went through there is very flexible so we're trying to keep that as straight as possible for as long as possible like starting at the start of the tube and then going along it Trying to keep it central. Right. In addition, um, this area got an O-ring, this little cutout here. So this dimension or this OD was fairly critical. So if you were thinking, talking about gating 90 degree to this face, um, that's another reason why we couldn't do that. Now we've done that in the past. It's really part dependent on what's critical to the part. Um, this face wasn't so critical. Um, it was just really this is the mating area of the part. But good question. Thank you. <clears throat> um, any questions on the catheter hub? Um, this one's probably the most intricate one. We'll see. If not, if something comes up, again, just add. Actually, this one's probably a little more intricate. Um, so this part is for irrigation um, sprinklers, um, kind of an adjustment knob, nozzle. So with this one, we had to get really creative because we actually had to mimic 
um, I'm going to make uh, hot tips or hot drops, three of them, and um, in one of our, our prototype tools. So you can kind of see this, this hot drop, you know, three points here, and spin the part around. And those all gated into, you know, this face here. So there's a lot going on with this part. Let me actually isolate that part. Hold on one second. And next we got another question come in. Um, gas line part. How do you hold the steel part that's created a tiny through hole in the space so it doesn't deflect under high molding pressure? Um, it, th that's the problem that we were running into. Um, so with the gating and you know trying to keep that that tube straight with the gating, and then you know over molding that secondary jacket with a second or with an over mold to um, to kind of beefen it up so we didn't have a thin area. Um, the customer couldn't have any standoffs or anything to hold that center. Um, that's that was one of their requirements. It needed to be a solid piece of plastic. Otherwise, we could have put some standoffs and filled them in with um, you know some silicone or, or something like that. But um, they could not have any access to that tube. So. Because that originally was just the one part, right? Yeah, yeah, we've done a couple different parts for them. Um, I mean, it was a single part. And then, it was a single part, and then moved to the overmold. To, the overmold yep. to cover up the plastic that wasn't around. Correct. Good question. Um, so this part, um, it's pretty intricate. We've got some really fine thread details. So this part roughly, you know, for size reference is, is roughly about an inch and a quarter tall. Uh, so as you can see, a lot of fine little details is these ribs, um, um, this kind of gear feature in here, um, these features, and then we have threading on top of that. Core outs that have to pull in the same direction of the thread. So there's a lot going on, some side actions here. So as we bring the tool all back together. So you can kind of see what's involved in this. It was, you know, one, two, three. No, nope, actually one, two, three, four, five. Roughly six individual pieces. So what we made was almost a mini mold that went into our mold base uh, to create this. So you can see this this portion of the, the mold was was creating the, the cavity side, so to speak. Um, actually, we got another part in there, but um, this was creating the thread features. This created the other side of the thread features. Um, and then we've got This thing's messing with me. Are you? All right. I can isolate this. Challenging just like the part. Boys. Yeah. Yeah, this was a fun one. Um, so this is creating all the core outs, and then we had the, um, the part that created almost the gear feature through the bottom come through here. And then this locked in with the other two hand loads that created the, the thread kind of through this area here. So if I go back. Um, all right, looks like we got a question come up here. Um, how will you, re or will you review how the part is cool? Um, Oh, the cooling. Um, I mean, with our tools, the way we do them, um, we just have standard cooling lines. We don't get in, into any cooling circuits or, or anything like that. Um, the unique thing with this part, well, no, that was the other part. Um, I mean, we really just have basic through lines, um, mainly due to the, the size of the tool in here and most of the stuff we do, it's we we don't do any you know conformal cooling or anything like that uh, due to the speed and timing required for these uh, prototype molds. 
So we do try to keep the water uh, systems fairly simple. Right. Okay. A lot going on there, but uh, it was a challenge and actually kind of fun to solve the problem and, and make this tool. All right. So this part, I mean, we call this one kind of a simple, simple overmold. Um, there's not much to it. Um, it's a pretty good design. So this is the substrate for first shot. As as we made it, we got a couple actions here. You know, create these undercuts. Um, inside's pretty straightforward, and then um, the red portion is you know what we ended up over molding um, you know nice areas to shut off on um, you know on the inside and out really no room for for flashing um, as long as everything's you know nice and crisp on the uh, on the substrate um, so basically, you're, you're over, you run your substrate, the green part, and basically your overmold tool is a, the cavitation looks like the green part with the cut out, and uh, it's fairly, fairly simple to overmold this part. As John said, as long as you have a nice, clean, sharp uh, party line and shutoffs. Right. Um, actually, I think that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, does anyone have any questions on any of the parts or questions in general um, that, that may have been sparked by these parts, not this, any of these parts specifically, but, um, you know, we're, we're here to answer any questions or um, and, and help with anything, really. No bad questions. Okay. A minute here. Dimensional control. Um, can you be more specific as far as how do we handle tolerances or? Okay. So dimensional control, I mean, how we handle tolerances. So um, with us, we it's hard for us to guarantee parts to print, um, especially at first shots. Not to say we can't get there because we're doing things quickly. Um, so you know how what our process is is we'll take your CAD and add the recommended shrink rate uh, per the material that was chosen. Uh, apply that to the mold design, and, and that's what we cut our tools to. Uh, and we cut our tools to a, a tolerance of plus or minus five thousandths of an inch, usually tighter than that, but. You know, in a well-designed part, that will translate to the to the plastic. So, um, but if you have tolerances tighter than you know plus or minus five thousandths, um, we can actually you know look at those and try to work those in. We just may require a, a round or two of grooming to to get there. Um, another question here: uh, What do you think about the melt flipper technology? We haven't really done with any of that. It's... Yeah. I really have no answer for that. Mess with it. Right. <clears throat> yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, another question here: Did any of the part examples have issues with sinks? If so, what was your method of identifying the cause and reducing them? <clears throat> um, I mean, this one—I don't think it really had much sink on it. It was cored out pretty well. I mean, we did have a thick area on the inside of the part here. Um, I remember correctly. Um, yeah, we do have a little bit of thick area. I think we had a little bit on this one, but it's really going to come down to if it's acceptable on a part. Uh, we try to review that up front at the quote process, uh, running mold flow analysis, identify thick areas or potential areas of sink. Um, and then uh, suggest changes to to avoid that. Um, some parts, some customers don't really matter what they look like. They're an internal part. Uh, they just need it to function. So uh, sync may not matter, but 
Um, depending, no, we, depending on the, the severity and, or what's projected and what the customer needs, sometimes suggestions of coring out areas, thinning wall stock, sometimes even uh, a texture uh, to the part will, will help mask or minimize that depending on the, the cosmetic nature of the piece. Right. Um, do you do CAE? Not, not really. No. And as you said, we do we do a we do a, a, a DFM at the beginning of the project to kind of try to highlight and pinpoint any trouble areas uh, potential, give the customer a, a, a confidence percentage on how we feel that the mold, uh, the tool parts, going to mold and the sinks and various things. So it's uh, that's about as ex the extent to which we. Uh, pre-engineer um, the tooling and the components. All right. Okay, any more questions? Looks like we got time for maybe one or two quick ones. All right. Okay, thanks for all the questions today. We appreciate it. And also for joining our webinar with us, if you have any questions or interest in eccentric products, please visit our website, social channels, or contact us directly at the number or the email listed on your screen. Uh, free, feel free to contact us. We're happy to help you. Thank you, everybody, and we hope you have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.